friends, if we could uh, just keep our fingers on that same passage of Scripture, I will uh, speak from there and then try to apply what we will learn from there to ourselves as uh, churches. I think all of you have uh, received a copy of uh, my book, God's Design for the Church. And what I am doing in the four sessions that I have is basically to get us to look at at least four of uh, those chapters. So we are really uh, just choosing a number of them. Um, I, I wish we had the time to go through all of them, but we do need to get back to work. So uh, it's only four. And in choosing them and going through them, we're not really going through the chapters as such in the way in which the chapters are written out. And I'm also not following the chronological order in which those chapters are in the book. So the very first one that we are dealing with is that of why or how uh, churches should be involved in missions. And so we are beginning from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to verse 20. If you've been a pastor long enough, you probably know that the moment you say to your people, let's turn to Matthew 28, all right, they already begin to say, oh, no, we know what this is all about. Uh, it's like they, they realize you just want to sort of hit them in the backside and get them out there uh, to do some, some work. So I wouldn't blame you if that's the way you feel right now uh, about it. Um, but the way I hope to proceed is uh, to look at one little word that appears four times in that passage. It's not too obvious but you will see in a moment, and it's the word all, A-double-L. I will use it to pin some thoughts as we think about the Great Commission, and then I will go to the chapter in my book and just pull out four ways in which, as churches, we can get involved in this commission. So that's the way we will go in our very first session. Uh, the Great Commission, as it is found in Matthew chapter 28, is not the only place where we find it. Uh, Mark deals with it, Luke deals with it, and finally John also deals with it. And that no doubt should convince anybody that by the time the Lord Jesus Christ was leaving planet Earth to go back to heaven, this is something he solidly nailed on the consciences of his people. However, when we get into the book of Acts, it again becomes fairly evident to us that though the Lord Jesus Christ had taught them and they all were able to recall this, when the rubber finally hit the road, it was not a priority to them. So there they were still in Jerusalem, there they were multiplying to the point where they were sitting on each other's heads. And yet it had to take persecution to get them out. And often we are like that as churches. Almost any minister of the gospel can be invited to a church to preach on missions and they will do a solid job. After all, it's there in the Bible. But then if you were to now ask the question, what is your church doing with respect to missions, you find that it is a future plan. It's something we are planning to do, all things being equal, instead of something we are actually involved in. It was the same with my own church, the very first time we ever spoke about doing missions. 
and as leaders going to our church to say, okay, let's plant our very first two churches. We were basically swimming against the tide. Everybody who responded had a reason why we can't do it now. Not now, maybe in the future. And it's just that we were resolved as church leaders that we we're going to do it, that we finally did so. The chapter in my book that deals with uh, missions begins with a little story. And the story is related to the way we once used to play football when we were kids. We, we, we didn't have watches that we would use to make sure that it was time to change goals and it was time to end. So we used to speak in terms of five goals change sides, and 10 finish ball. So you had to score five goals before you could change sides. Now, if you had a weak opponent, a weak opposition, the game finished very quickly. But if you were more or less equal, you just went on and on and on to the point where you could hardly see the ball anymore because it was dark. But whenever one side said, let's stop here because they were winning, the other side said, no, 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 we agreed. Five change goal, ten finish ball. We go on. And of course, we often got into trouble with our parents. When we arrived home so late, we missed dinner very dirty, walking through the front door. Where were you? Five change goal, ten finish ball. And that's the kind of mentality we have as churches often. And the truth is that we need to realize we need to all be involved in the work of missions now. In this particular chapter, as I already said, we have four alls. The first one is pretty obvious in verse 18. Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The second all is found in verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The third all is found in verse 20 teaching them to observe all or everything that I have commanded you. And then the last all is found at the very end, and behold, I am with you always, all the time, to the end of the age. The first all and the last all are related to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's telling us something about himself. The first is that he is the, the sovereign one. He's been given all authority. And the last is a promise that he is going to be with us all the time. So those first two, like a sandwich, are about him. The first piece of bread and the second piece of bread. It's the middle that now comes to us. It's what speaks about whether there is obedience or not. And as I use the example of a sandwich, whether it's a tomato sandwich or an egg sandwich or a cheese sandwich, doesn't often depend on the two sides. Those continue. It depends on what's in the middle. And that's exactly the situation here. We have a double responsibility. One is reaching out to all ethnic groups, all communities, all tribes and peoples and languages and nations. And we also have the responsibility of bringing those converts together into localized entities that we call local churches. And there, discipling them, teaching them to obey all that the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded. Quickly, as we go through those four steps, first of all, 
Jesus begins the Great Commission with the fact that all authority has been given to him. Now, in a sense, he is and has always been God. So to say all authority has been given to me is really sounding like perhaps um, a person who is a sovereign as uh, Queen Elizabeth had been for 70 years, now saying to you, before she died, that all authority has been given to me. He's saying, of course. I mean, you've been on the throne for 70 years. This is a news. What does Jesus mean that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me? Well, it's obviously speaking as the great God-man who in his pre-existence was the sovereign God of the universe through whom everything was created. But he's speaking in terms of having then been humiliated in taking on himself human nature living as he had been here on earth, suffering and finally dying our death on the cross, bearing the full penalty for our sin. It was a fruit of a covenant agreement between him and the Father that having thus paid for all our sin, he was consequently to be exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high. And that he was to be given the reins of the whole of history. That he was now to drive history to his desired end. And in driving it that way, on top of his agenda is the bringing in of his elect people. And that's where history is going. Until when finally the last of his elect come in, he will descend and he will bring history to an end completely. Ushering in his eternal kingdom. It is that exaltation that Jesus is speaking about here. Now, in a sense, it was just about to happen as he ascends to heaven. But he is speaking about it as though it has now happened because it was completely dependent on that death that has taken place. He's done it. And therefore, the father who is faithful was going to carry out his promise as well. Now, remember, it is his mediatorial kingship that he's referring to here. And remember, at the center of that agenda is the bringing in of his people. Do you see why the next statement makes sense? Therefore, go we make disciples of all nations. Is basically saying, join me in this great agenda in history. As I sit on my throne, that is going to be the central thought in my mind. You are going to be the means of realizing it on earth. Hence, that second all. All authority. Yes, and now it is the task of all nations. The disciples that just were speaking to at this point were all Jews. And for them, the phrase all nations means the Gentiles. Because they always thought in terms of these categories. It is us and them, us and them us and them. And so as Jesus was saying, go and make disciples of all nations, they understood 
very clearly that that's the responsibility that he was giving them. And that was hard because it meant them getting out of their comfort zone where they knew everything within the context of uh, the tabernacle and the temple and the exclusion that God had placed upon them from everybody else. And now they're being told to break that boundary and to do so deliberately. You can well understand why it did not occur to them that it's now. Despite him saying to them that they were to be witnesses for him in Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, it still did not quite register. And that's the reason why when Peter was given that vision of that shit coming down with animals at once upon a time, they, they were told not to... Uh, to eat, and then finally it dawned on him as he entered Cornelius' household that uh, God was saying, this is what I've been talking about. Well, when the brethren go to hear about it in Jerusalem, they were mad. They almost popped off his head. How, how could you do this, Peter? And Peter spoke the way in which Aaron spoke to Moses once upon a time. Remember, people just gave me jewels, threw them into the fire, and pop, out came this golden calf. He basically said the same thing. You know, I saw the shit, I had animals, some people came, I followed them, and, you know, I was just talking. And as I was talking, well, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So who, who was I? To deny them, the obvious. That's the reason why I proceeded to baptize them. And the brethren there said, you know what? I think it's obvious. God has opened the door to the Gentiles. It took an actual intervention of God. Despite having kicked them out of Jerusalem. To enter into Gentile territory. For them to realize that this is what God was actually commanding. And trust me, it was there all over the Old Testament about the people of Israel being the means through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It, it was there. But for some reason, they were still blinded to it. Before we throw stones at them, let's realize it's often the same with us. For us to, to, to recognize that this is our responsibility to go to all people groups. Our responsibility. Look into that mirror and say, it's my responsibility. Together with our people that worship the Lord on the Lord's day, to get the gospel out. Quickly, in the third place is the third all, and it is teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's only possible because of that middle gap that speaks in terms of baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In other words, initiating them into these localized communities that we refer to as local churches. Where they covenant together to be a light in their community where they are going to live together as brothers and sisters in Christ, where they will be together worshiping the Lord and living under his visible government. So that if people want to know 
how God wants them to live, their creator, they simply look at the people who gather in this place and say, yes, I know how he lives. I know how she lives. They are my neighbors. We work together. We go to the same school. I see how God wants me to live. But that's only going to happen as they are taught regularly. Because it is the truth that sanctifies. It is, as the Apostle Paul spoke in terms of teaching them, the whole counsel of God, that their own culture begins to reform and becomes more and more biblical because they are thinking now God's thoughts after him. And what a responsibility it is for us to be teaching the people of God, first of all, what to believe according to the Bible, and then how to live according to that belief. It's one of the greatest tragedies that we have in the church in Africa, the lack of teaching. So one of the topics I will deal with is how to grow your church spiritually or qualitatively. We'll leave it for that. But trust me, it's not enough that we are going out there and just sharing the gospel and then we don't know where people are going after that. We are to urge them to covenant together with God's people, to live under Christ's leaders, given shepherds, so that together they might shed the light of Christ. Number four, the promise of our Savior. And basically what Jesus is saying is this, that you are not alone as you do this. I will be with you all the way to the end of this process. And behold, I am with you all the time, always, to the end of the age. Now, as you know, most sovereigns send their soldiers into the battlefield, and then they remain in the safety of the palace. So you get killed out there, sorry, I just get news, you died. Well, people die, others survive, keep on fighting. But our Lord is saying, I'm going to be with you. And he is with us by his spirit as we are in obedience following his commands. And basically that's what he was doing with the New Testament church. That's what reason why he kicked them out of Jerusalem. That's one reason why he was able to lead and guide them where to go as they were taking the gospel step by step. And that's why he was able to, to get them to, to work together, work collectively for this great cause, this great enterprise of reaching the nations. In the last book of the Bible, um, John, who was the final surviving uh, apostle, saw this vision, which was obviously a vision of Jesus Christ, walking among the lampstands. And we are told the lampstands were the churches. He, he's there. He is like a priest trimming the lamp so that they can shine more brightly. That's what Jesus is doing. He's not sitting in heaven just enjoying the presence of angels. He's among us by his spirit. Leading his churches, leading his people to triumphant, in triumphant procession. 
bringing in those who are lost. Well, that's what the Great Commission is about. And it's just good to realize that when we are involved in the work of missions, we are at the very center of the agenda of God. How did the New Testament church proceed to fulfill all this? How did they do it? I want to suggest just four quick areas, and with that, I will hurry on to close. Uh, first of all, they deliberately sent out missionaries. That's what they did. And some of the missionaries they sent out were actually their best men, not best men in wedding terms, but, but best men, like we have in Acts 13, where the individuals who are sent out are Saul and Barnabas. The very individuals who planted that church and ensured that, that church grew and matured. But in response to the Holy Spirit's guidance, they sent out these men and they proceeded to plant churches further into the Roman province of Asia and then in due season crossed over into Europe. They sent out missionaries. Is your local church doing that? Are you sending out church planting missionaries? Take note of that. That was one practical way in which they did this. Secondly, they prayed for missionaries. They prayed for missionaries. The Apostle Paul, in literally each and every one of those letters that he writes to the churches, leads for prayer, asking these churches to pray. In fact, I think it's in, in, in 1 Thessalonians where he simply says, pray for us. That's all. Just pray for us. And as churches, we must be deliberate about that. You know, sometimes I, I preach around in churches and find myself in one or two of their prayer meetings. And when you sit there and you listen to the prayer requests, you, 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 you'd think the Great Commission finished long ago. Because all the prayers are about, you know, I'm traveling tomorrow, pray for safety. Uh, my uncle is unwell in hospital, about to undergo surgery, pray uh, for him. Uh, I'm looking for a place for my kid, for school, pray for her or him or us to find a good place, uh, and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's as if God is some, some mighty servant of ours who needs to save us. So tell him what he needs to do for us. When you read what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer, the first half of it has got nothing to do with our little agendas. The first half. Our Father who art in heaven, our Lord be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's about him and his kingdom. The spread of his kingdom. We need to get back there. We need to train our people by saying to them, the first half of the prayer time, please keep your personal requests. Keep them. <laughs> we'll bring them in the second half. <laughs> Could we have kingdom prayer requests? Thank you very much. And you'll notice for the first few weeks to be dead silence because it's... Uh, Sort of a changing of mode of thinking. But after a while, they begin to realize, yes, actually, this is the way the church ought to be. We ought to bring before the Lord 
requests related to the extension of his kingdom. Prayer letters from missionaries that are, as it were, hot off the press should be read out in those meetings so that we are praying, adding, as it were, fuel to what's happening there. Let me quickly hurry on to the last two. And the next is that of raising and sending support for missionaries. And by this, I mean finances and um, other kinds of uh, support that they need. And again, being deliberate about that. That's one of the reasons why Paul's letter to the Philippians is so full of joy, despite the fact that it was being written in prison. It's because he was writing into this church that really supported him and the missionary team that he was involved in as they spread the gospel across Europe, across Macedonia, into Achaia. This Philippian church that they had planted was a great support for them. He rejoiced in partnership with them. Again, that's the way missionaries should feel about us as local churches. They should say, thank you. Thank you for the level of commitment that you have towards us. And then lastly, which is fairly closely related to the prayer requests, is being deliberate in having missionaries to come and share with us reports about the Lord's work where they are. It's one thing to just read a letter. It's another to have a live missionary in front of us telling us what's going on out there. The challenges. And perhaps even inviting us, come and visit. Come and be with us. And so on. And that's what the Apostle Paul um, often did as he went around the churches, sharing something of what God was doing there. Well, I say a lot more in uh, the book, in the appropriate chapter, and I trust that you will take time to read there. I give about uh, six to seven reasons why our churches are not doing this. And I pray that that will not be true of you. But if it is, I pray that you will genuinely repent and make amends so that we may all be a great army for missions. Amen.